7 p.m. Welcome, welcome everybody to the to our second in person meeting since it's over there. Uh, since we just we all have spent a bunch of time socializing after we went in here. I did remember to bring the sodas. I did forget the keys, unfortunately, somebody else had them. So let's go around the room real quick. I'm Bill, I'll have the floor be next. Gary K67 CS. I'm Ned AA7A. Big Hayward 7M. Mike, I'm 7A7. Dan, K9DR. Dan, I'm Long is the Greg, Brian, Dunning, Seven, Walt, and Ray, Martin, and I need to be. Well, I'm going to take both of you. OCA, Jim, K7, and Y. Tom, K7, R. Sean, and 7 nwl Richard, and 7 nt Thomas, and 7 x Virgil, K7, BZ. Okay. You have the online. Yeah, on, online guys. Thanks for remembering that. Online guys, go ahead and introduce yourselves. You have to take yourselves off mute one at a time. I don't hear any audio. Mike KC seven V is here. Okay. Wow. seven R H. Mike K seven N G. Israel, K7HI. Okay, Jim and seven, Jim and seven US, good evening. The Don WA. Don WA7RLL. Hey, everybody. Thanks for attending. And again, thanks to Virgil for getting all the electronics set up. Let's uh, step down to the next page in the prison. So I was going to hold the business meeting first, then the activities report will break for cookies, and then Ned's going to give our presentation. Next one. Uh, Mike, in 7MW, we have a treasurer's report to... Yes. Uh, those are the figures as of the end of March. Uh, we have actually another $25 because somebody will be late. Uh, and we now have another count of uh, actually one twenty one. That just happened a couple of days ago. Yeah. Speak up. Any, any questions for the treasurer before we go to the next slide? Okay, next step. Okay, picnic committee. Uh, where, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, briefly, we've been doing a lot of work with the board over the last couple of months for uh, hopefully May barbecue. Uh, which is not going to happen. Different size, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a couple of venues that we're looking at. Uh, we have advantages and disadvantages. So, right now, we're postponing it until probably this fall ish. Um, quick show of hands. It's probably going to be barbecue, barbecue, with Mexican food backup. Quick show of hands who likes it. That's everybody, we're good. That's a full monitor. The problem that we're running into is not a food vendor. Food's easy, not cheap, but it's easy. Um, the hard part is finding some place to actually hold. And one thing I was working for is if we could pull off in May, it's pretty much have to be an indoor facility. We've got one of those that we're beginning to work with a little bit, but again, it's not going to be between now and probably September or so. Um, if you go to a full blown restaurant, if it's pricey, then the ones that I've talked to so far don't really suit how we eat. There's a lot that goes into that. The good part is, I did talk to one facility that I was with me. I held it on a Saturday, a nine hour reservation for only $6,700. Oh, so I don't I don't plan on us going there, but I'm not sure that <laughs> we're looking at controlling costs on the YouTube. Um now we can't go to the city park. 
that's an option. Um, I looked at, at a couple of, I didn't physically look at, but I looked at the web website for shop sale, and they have a bar or a bottle, whatever that is, for 65 bucks per half a day. The question is, are we going to have problems with outside folks coming through, wanting food, et cetera, et cetera? The door does not get closed on a part that we just haven't found one that, that fits us as closely as the pair of you're hired with bathrooms, right? Or bathrooms, right? The only downside is if you're not, you don't have a kind of park next to seven dollars to drive it from the vehicle, so five or four people in the vehicle, so seven bucks. The site rent for the day is like four dollars. You get for four hours. They do it Monday through Friday, you check with the reserve and the tanks. Two big models will see a lot of people. Do you have any contact information? Sure. Yeah. I will be getting a hold of you. Right. Go to the commission. Go ahead. Come down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a confirmation of our expertise to get to. It's just 202 to um, McDowell or McCallops, and you're right there. It's not hard to do. The only potential that I, I see is maybe unsupported. That's, we live out like Southeast Fielder, and that's on the east east end of the valley, out there at the National Park. Um, we've got a fair number of folks from the West Valley, and that would be, that's probably a hundred miles away. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so that's one of the things that, that we kind of have to factor in is, and the parapet is ideal because it's in the middle of everything, and that's what we do stuff. Unfortunately, it's no longer an option, and that's like we get a job for SRP and we can get to go back to the so, um, but yeah, I'll give a to you. Probably email. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 just so you know, I'm currently in the second one. I'm traveling back and forth between here and Seattle. I'm trying to leave so I don't reply right away. That's fine. Uh, because I'm, I'm being a similar. So okay. So the air is not fine. So, we got some good work on time. I appreciate it. Um, and like I said, we're going to make it a good thing. I will tell you from a cost standpoint, the day it comes in 20 percent most use is done. It's not going to happen anymore, I don't think. Um, $10 a you're, you're the money guy. You get to deal with it. I've got to find it. Um, we are, the board is starting to begin to think about looking at the fan today. Totally separate from barbecue. Right now, we're making some progress in the market. And those of you that I can call it, uh, criticisms and suggestions. So. Um, I looked at that briefly, but not in depth. That would be more central than a new creek house. It's kind of on the south side of the inch. Do you have any information on this? We just worked with last night with Dan and we did talk about so well, I'll add that to my list of stuff. Well, everything on the west side, we can get it from the other place I was looking at and the way to park and park at the park at the Lincoln ish. We used that in Orchard Street. Yeah, we used to have a lot of people that were going to be in the park. The other thing I looked at was the uh, the Lincoln Park and Lincoln Park. And I'm kind of guesstimating that the three members and uh, uh, yes, we're probably going to be looking at about 85 on each boat. So we need to be able to uh, house that number comfortably. If it's even in September and October, probably indoor, just keep the temperature down, and we don't have to be able to go a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, just to resync the notes. Well, I was working on the presentation I did that last night, going through the emails. We were talking about BHM's church in Tempe. Did that fall through for May 14th? Is that the Catholic church? No, the uh, Gethsemane church. No, that's that's the holding stage right now. Okay. Um, so May 14th is not? No, there, is, there will not be a barbecue in May. Okay. Unless somebody else. Okay, up. everybody look at that screen and ignore it. 
So we're we're still going to have a, a regular meeting then a regular in May. Regular meeting in May. May 5th. We'll yeah. be here on Thursday. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Bill, I hear a voice. Uh, can it? Bill, I don't. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Yes. Yeah. K seven SP. Um, I don't know if there's a way you guys can turn the audio gain up on your mic. Maybe my computer, but having a difficult time hearing discussion. Uh, the other thing is, I, and I don't know if anybody realized that, but the day on the screen for the barbecue is also the, the day of the Prescott Ham Fest, which is only a one day affair this year. You know, Steve, one of, the, one of the things that we're trying to factor in is there is contest, there is ham fest, uh, because we want to be able to have the attend those and participate in those. So that kind of narrows down the number of, of days that are available if we do a weekend. So we're, we're aware of that and we're, we're looking at that. And Saturday, May the 14th, I don't remember. Oh, that came from, it's not a contest weekend. And we were aware that uh, it was a hand fest weekend, but it's not an issue because we're not doing anything. Else. How do I strike it? Thanks. Response. Yeah. In your text. I can delete it. That looks good. There you go. Okay. Fixed. And everybody wants to attend, correct? Yep. Everybody. So Luther, right? Okay. So to reiterate. And I hope I'm standing close enough to the microphone right here. to hear me. Ah, this microphone is at this end. Um, the, the May 14th is not being considered right now. So we'll hold a, a regular meeting on the first Thursday of May right here in the church and on Zoom. And we will try to get a club barbecue for some time in the fall is our tentative plan. And if you have suggestions, get with N7NWL. He's chairing the uh, picnic committee. Any other questions from the room or from the computer? I have a presentation from the National Weather Service set up on May 5th. So. Oh, OK. Yeah, so we've got that meeting. Yeah, we were thinking that would be a great presentation for the, uh, for the picnic, because they'd be in charge of the weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was trying to find somebody not super technical. Okay. Any other issues to discuss regarding the the club picnic that's not going to happen as we thought it would? Okay. Next uh, next uh, slide. Okay. Scholarship fund. Um, we donated money to them. They didn't award it. They expect them to award it in May. And somebody on the board in our board meeting proposed that we give an honorary or a uh, complimentary membership to whatever presumably youth person who wins the scholarship fund. And they may or may not use the membership and join our meetings, but it might give us a little bit more visibility and maybe encourage some, some young person to get more active in ham radio. At the very least, reach out and make sure they're invited to, to yeah. the club. Yeah, yeah I, should, I should do that too, send, send them the, the meeting schedule and so on. Who was the most recent in the Is that that down in the system? She's going to school up there, so. Oh. Okay. Any other discussion on this? Okay, next slide. Uh, we got a thank you letter from Northern California DX Foundation. I don't think there's any need for discussion on it, but uh, we did make a donation to them as we all voted for before. And the next one, Vizelli Committee, Ned told me earlier there's not much to report this month, but he'll be giving a presentation later. Do you want to say anything about this? Or do you want to start your question? Okay, next step. Uh, w 7 sorry? We should be there today. Oh, is, is today the day that Vizelli would have happened if it wasn't canceled, like our May picnic? Uh, where's W07 on? There you are. Did you? Uh, get any response to your request for somebody to support you with that? No, I, you gotta stop worrying about that. That job is over. I am not doing that job. Take word we're from. 
No. Okay. Okay. That sounded like so, he, that sounded like he volunteered to do it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel that. He, you know, last, last time we teased the guy into taking a job, he ended up becoming vice president. Okay. So I should say, if anybody wants to take it over, C W O seven O. Okay, repeater committee, I presume there's nothing new to report. And W7J is our technical guy for the repeaters. And he suggested that uh, we just simply find some alternative we should consider the wall of the thing just as an alternative. I don't, there are plus and minus to that. I didn't know why I discussed it at the board, but maybe who was telling about the future. I think we can all change it. Maybe the, the student who's attending NAU would be good with it. <laughs> the next hour would be able to take it over. Okay. So I, I just have a question. Uh, who has checked into the who said it? It's the guy who was the last time. It's not just trying to work from the base mobile as they kind of cut out around. It's an I 17 to wrap up and then it's not 17. I got, I did make a assumption that the program to take a little more time. So if you're a repeater, they call CPU gas that will work. It does does the output transmit the PL tone? Uh, it does not. Okay. That means I gotta reprogram the radios. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to figure out why it's not doing it because it should be showed. It might be something I don't have to check right now with the CPS and the radio. So I guess I asked somebody back to my second the phone call I was just yeah, should do it. So I'm still working on it. Okay. Why well, did you get the uh new antenna? Uh the new antenna is actually going up. Uh, end of this month, we're going to get information that yeah, that somebody's coming out of that to the food truck to do some other work on it. Okay. In, any other club business from the floor or from the computer? I brought a few uh, uh, sample copies of the national contest for a little of uh, anybody who has not ever seen it. I am the editor uh, in my second year uh, for AWRL, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's pretty good publication. Yeah, so, look at it online. Uh, help yourself. If you're an AWRL member, you can, you can see it uh, online at any point. That was a strange way to phrase it. It's not if you're an AWRL member, it's since you're all AWRL members. <laughs> Most of us are. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any any other uh, business anybody would like to discuss before we move on to the uh, to NQ7R and the uh, activities reports? Anybody on the on the computer have anything you'd like to bring before the club, other than your complaint about the audio, which is legitimate? <laughs> He's just back his turn. Oops. Go ahead and do his activity report. Well, I know I don't have a whole lot of uh, changes to report. Other than uh, I got new, uh, I got a new set of antennas and uh, amplifiers, so that helps. Although, unfortunately, it just <laughs> amplifies everything. But anyway, uh, this is the data that I got today. Uh, Larry and the high power area uh, is running up on the uh, uh, HF challenge. And uh, amazingly, in the low power division, Steve K7SP is really racking up the DX. Uh, I believe primarily on FT8, but 
perhaps uh, other modes too. Uh, I think I got everything uh, in numerical order. Uh, if you go to the next, uh, Ellen, this was again one of my uh, wild hairs that uh, uh, not too many people have gotten excited about. The idea was uh, to work each of these 15 countries uh, once on CW, once on uh, phone, and once on digital. Or if you didn't want to do the, all three, you could just pick uh, two modes. Nobody's picked up on that one, but uh, uh, but Jim has picked up uh, a little bit, and Jim up in uh, Prescott uh, has gotten into this too. Unfortunately, I I didn't make it clear that uh, you should only work you know, once for each mode. And some of these you work like uh, 13 different stations on digital, uh, a PY station. So I got that squared out for it. But anyway, it just was something I thought uh, would be of interest to some people. Uh, our HF Marathon, uh, again, Larry's leaving out of the way for us showing us how it's done. And uh, maybe that would be a good uh, presentation sometime. And Ned will show us how to do 3,000 challenge points. So uh, Larry can show us how to do the marathon. <laughs> anyway, uh, again, uh, Steve is uh, hanging right in there, low power. And uh, so I think we have some pretty uh, pretty good numbers just uh, early in the year. Uh, let's see, uh, six uh, the expeditions. Uh, I totally, uh, yeah, I forgot to put one in there. I added a KP3 station just to give people something to work. Only one guy remembered that was West Down in Tucson. I didn't even remember having added that to the list. But uh, I guess Ned, uh, Fred is going to PJ2T. Uh, I know he's running P, uh, slash PJ2. So I assume he, but uh, as part of a really big group, I decided not to include him as a uh, uh, working, but if you worked Fred in uh, K7M, uh, either mode, uh, send me numbers on that. Otherwise, we don't have much for uh, the expeditions coming up. Uh, the, the Central uh, African uh, group got postponed now to November, but uh, coming up next to be the TX5 band. Uh, that group. Uh, okay, six meters. I missed the big opening to South America, I guess. I just saw, I think Lee posted something and I didn't even hear about it. That's the, the fun of being out in the movies. Okay, digital roundup. Again, another wild hair. Uh, in fact, I'm going to actually make that. Yeah, I did make a change. You know, in the summer doldrums, if we get bored, maybe you could try a, a download the FL Digi and uh, I'll see if you can find somebody on Olivia, Destia, Hellschreiber. I, I, I really, I find Hellschreiber kind of interesting. It's kind of like facsimile. But uh, anyway, there's all kinds of uh, exotic digital modes that you could run. And uh, I think it'd be kind of fun to learn how to do some of them. And then finally, uh, alphabet soup. Oh, I screwed that one up, didn't I? Uh, K7SP should be in there uh, just ahead of me. So 
So I'm still waiting for gas aware to come on. I think later in the summer, I think the guy is scheduled to go to a gas aware. Otherwise, Oman is probably out of my reach. So there's only two O's that, that can get you through the alphabet. And that's about it, I guess, for this month. And uh, appreciate all of the, uh, the reports. One thing uh, I wanted to mention, Tom was telling me here uh, about his work. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work with satellites, doing CW uh, uh, grid square chasing. So uh, if you've got something sort of unusual that you're doing, uh, let me know. We can always put up a special slide or something. Okay, thank you, Virgil, for running that. So we can just point to me again. Just stand right here. Okay, that should be uh, not that one. Two before that. You got that one. And okay, so let's take a break now. And we'll bring up it. Eight eight seven A. After a break, and let's see if anybody has anything to discuss before we uh, break. On, on the computer, we're going to break for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay, there you go. I'm used to being in a control here, uh, Virgil. You know. I had to get things started. Okay, well, good evening. Uh, Virgil contacted me a while back, asked for if I could give a program. And uh, it, and I, I, I was looking through my files, and I have like about 300 programs that I've given over the course of time. Um, but I, I also know that I take months building almost each and every one of them. And I don't currently have anything in the hopper. Uh, so I suggested I, uh, I re give again the, the Road to 3000, which is, uh, I, I think, a pretty good talk. Uh, and I, I promised to update it uh, since I've given this in uh, the last gave it in 2018. I think I test drove it uh, at the I think in March uh, 2018 meeting, and then I gave it at Visalia. And after Visalia, I got approached by about 20 people who wanted me to fly to their hometown and give it in their uh, local club, and it never happened. I mean, I was headed for uh, the, the uh, Baker Island expedition, and then COVID uh, rolled in, and you know we haven't been doing any of this kind of stuff. So, so I have really nothing in the uh, new category for uh, for programs. Although I'm still, I have a number of things going on. I'll give you guys a teaser here. Some of these things that I'm, I'm working on uh, that are going to be pretty interesting. Uh, the uh, the big project going on around my place right now is uh, is is a complicated transition uh, to a, a re-entry into a two-meter moon bounce at my house, and I'm also going to uh, remote all of my equipment to a uh, building on the backyard. So that way, in the house, I'll have nothing but the the desktops of uh, of every station, and no amplifiers, uh, no heat, no clunking relays, no uh, uh, just massive piles of, of, of objects uh, uh, strapped together uh, mindlessly in, in front of me. So, uh, so I have right now in my shop. I have uh, three full size racks uh, uh, filled with gear. Uh, uh, mountains of cables and connectors, which is always a, a sign that you're working on a station. And, uh, and probably in June, or probably, probably June, I'll, I'll fire it up and the entire station, uh, including two meter moon bounce and all my HF and six meter work will all be done uh, in the same way I operate my remote stations out in Safford, I will operate my home station out in the backyard. So that way I have one common interface uh, to radios, no matter where they are, as opposed to having to sit down and BX uh, in my, front of my K3, and then oh, I want to work Stafford, but I have to, you know, throw a bunch of switches and do stuff, and, and then now the K3 turns into a K3 zero and talks to some uh, distant K3 connected to some distant antenna. So, so the new way is that I'll always have a virtual front uh, de desktop with front of the, the front panel of the radio uh, for no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing. So it's, uh, it's gonna be a new, new approach and I'm, uh, nothing's easy. Uh, one of the interesting things I'm working on is uh, transporting audio across the internet. 
Okay, I mean, right now, you know, we all, I mean, and if you do remotes, you have a, you buy a micro bit pair, uh, you know, a remote, a radio unit and a control unit, and it sort of takes in all the audio and sets up a VOIP channel across the network to the other side and it comes out of the control uh, micro bit unit. And that ties into your radio, which gets your headsets and everything like that. But, uh, you know, remote rigs are getting hard, getting hard to find and, and they're not keeping up. It's not changing very much and it's not keeping up with, with radios. Radios are continuing to migrate. And at some point, we're all gonna have to learn how to, to uh, transport audio uh, over, over, over the internet. It's gonna be something, uh, another, thing you'll have to know how to do as a DXer and a contester, uh, just like you've learned a little bit, maybe maybe not enough, about how, how to uh, deal with networks. You're gonna have to worry about transporting uh, uh, radio functions, uh, like radio control, uh, audio, uh, keying, everything will now be transported over a network and you're all gonna learn about how all that kind of works. Uh, it's, it's just gonna be the way I think radio is gonna go. So. I'm, um, I'm diving into a head first and it's going to be an interesting project and that will be something I will put together. It'll be a, a very complex uh, talk because there's so many topics uh, that, that, that you, you have to, uh, you know, so many different technologies you have to master. Uh, it, takes, uh, it takes time and patience and, and you have to find somebody out there to tell you that one little thing you didn't know about. It's always that one little thing. Uh, example, uh, I'm looking at this thing called Mumble, uh, Mumble Server. Okay, it's a Mumble is a is a technology developed by the, the gamers out there, the guys with headsets who would you know shoot them up uh, on a computer and they all uh, interact with each other uh, wherever the heck they are. And Mumble is a kind of a transport for audio, so everybody can have headsets and all talk in a group group session. And uh, and it's just kind of a simple system if you know how it's set up. Okay, so you so you find out where to get the the mumble server and you go oh, okay just download and install it right i did that and then you look around as well where's the desktop icon i click to make it go well it's a script you got to learn how to uh you know talk to it and uh oh oh but to get it to actually install in any file which you need to get started you have to have the administration privileges on the computer you're in and then it gets stored somewhere and they never tell you where that is. And so, so no matter what you do, you get started, you can never get started because there's something you don't know. And, and, and so that's half the battle is just, because nobody writes a document that says, you know, do this and this and this and this and it works. And uh, it, it's just not there yet, but it's, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be the core of, of our remote uh, capability because we're, we're finding that we, you know, to bring on a new user to use our system, they have to, we have to hand them a, a known good, you know, K3 mini and a, and a remote rig unit, and and uh, and then we have to talk to them about how to integrate into their state, into their network. And, you know, it's a it's a it's a big thing to overcome just to get somebody to join our group. Uh, with with what you're we're going to be learning all about here over the course of time. I know uh, Lee's got some articles coming up from some experts out there about how to build you know, this sort of this new capability of being able to instantaneously become a uh, person who can access a radio system and just jump in and start using it. It's just gonna be the way things are gonna go here uh, very quickly. It's gonna be, you know, I, I thought for years I would, I would never buy another radio that had a front panel, but I did buy one more. Uh, but from here forward, there, there will not be any more you know, new radios that, that, that I bought just to touch the front panel. They're all gonna be virtual uh, boxes that produce functions. And all those functions are managed by applications that are on computers. That's that's going to be the way it's going to be going. It's, it's kind of interesting to be, you know, jumping in to do that. So let me talk about the uh, my my road to three thousand. Uh, this is a fun uh, presentation put together. I spent about a about a month uh, scanning in a bunch of QSL cards, which is something I liked about DXing and ham radio was uh, walking out to the mailbox and ripping open a bunch of envelopes. And get some really really interesting cards and and, and grooving on them um because when you work 3000 uh, the xcc xds uh, you end up with a very large pile of qso cards to have to do that uh because all of this was done really 
uh, all of my work on the tree top was done before Log of the World was even around. So it's uh, so I have a mountain of these cards, and I, I wanted, wanted to capture them. I did it in this presentation. But uh, a little, you, know, you guys know about DXing. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the uh, something I learned. You can read this. It's not important. Something I learned from from Wayne Mills. I, I've been talking to Wayne Mills over the years about a lot of topics, and something he mentioned to me that that has taken a long time to sink in is that uh, one of the problems with the XCC is the is the is there's an ordinal number associated with your your count. You know, you have so many countries. Well, I have so many plus two. So therefore I must be better than you because I have a bigger number than you have. Okay. And and he said it was never invented for that. It was not ever a competition. You know, DXing is not a competition. It's a it's a it's a it's a pastime. It's an activity and that you you satisfy yourself when you do that. I mean the fact that your tally is not up to someone else's tally doesn't matter. Uh, uh, it may indicate that you want uh, a larger number, and you should work to do that. But there's no real competition, and we all know that it's. Uh, we all feel uh, out here in the West, Western United States, we all feel uh, sort of like second-class citizens if you do start to get excited about what your number is, because your numbers don't stand up to many of the those in the game on the, on the East Coast or in Europe or other places in the world. It's just uh, it's just not uh, just never right. In fact, uh, they talk about it here. I gave a program a long time ago here, which is actually still on the internet. It's called DXCC Sucks. Okay. <laughs> and the subtitle is on six and 160. But the point is that is that don't look at your numbers and compare them to somebody else's numbers because uh, you, you live in different places and the, and the world uh, uh, is made available to you in different ways. And, and there's no way that there's a direct competition between uh, here and say uh, Rome or something like that. It's just, it's just not fair. So don't worry about that. So, uh, so the, the program was uh, was part of a uh, the, the DXCC Challenge program came out of a an effort in the year 2000 to sort of update uh, the DXCC program. At first, they were going to uh, eliminate the, uh, the deleted uh, uh, category. They're going to call it. Uh, Fun that we were currently going to call it, uh, and that got a lot of people sort of uh, unnerved because this DXing is it's almost it's almost like a religion, and you, and you can't be tearing down uh, people's gods. You just can't be tinkering with the real core stuff. Uh, it, it's it's hard to describe. I know I had trouble explaining to my wife why it was so important to work this guy on this island. Uh, it was right next to some other island, just like it. Uh, I, you just can't explain some, some to some people the the, the 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 rapture of logging a new one. It's just it's just impossible to describe it. Uh, but uh, but anyway, it's, but the, so the DXCC Challenge Program did a really fundamental change to the game of DXing. I think before 2000, it was rare to see a DXpedition. They had 25 operators. Okay, you would see the expeditions with seven, eight, nine, ten operators, and they would get on two, three stations. But after 2000, when there was a demand to get the XCC challenge points, it became the duty of the expedition planners to to be on all of the bands. And you know, and if you look at the you know the, the propagation, uh, you know. At, from a, a point in the earth like Kingman Reef and places like Europe and you know West East Coast and uh, whatever, you realize that you need to put on a bunch of stations, which means you need to have a bunch of operators. And so it, it really changed the the, the, the structure of, of the expedition teams, I think, in a big way, because because uh, the demand was there to 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 try to work all of the bands, one sixty through ten, maybe six. Maybe satellite, maybe other stuff. I don't know. So it, it really made a big difference in in the in the, uh, in the game. So the uh, <laughs> the original plan was to have a, a the Soto Cup be given every year, a new cup every year to the person who was number one on the uh, on the challenge list. And our good friend here, uh, E8AK, 
won the first one and everyone since uh, because he happens to live in, in magic, uh, magic country. Everything apparently is easy from EAA. EAA is really right in the middle of, right almost on the uh, mag Earth's magnetic equator. Uh, he's, he has this whole trans equatorial propagation functionality available to him throughout the year. Everything is available. Everything comes to EAA. Everything does without any effort. Uh, so it's not surprising that someone there uh, isn't uh, doesn't have the biggest totals. But he also has a, a, a room full of uh, trophies, apparently. Uh, so here's sort of a plot of where I gave this presentation first time in 2018. These are where the the uh, those who have achieved the 3,000 milestone. Uh, which is the highest milestone in the program. These are where they are. There were 112 stations, I believe, in, in, at the time that are above 3,000. Most of them are in Europe. Uh, there's a sprinkling of them in the United States, uh, one or two in Japan, but it's uh, it's it's very much clustered around uh, uh, the, the uh, European uh, area. The, the highest total at that time uh, in the United States was the like 4 dr You can hear them in every pile. Uh, the most Western station. Here we go. Okay. Huh. This is what when you use somebody else's computer with uh, <coughs> faux software, uh, you get these uh, sort of artifacts. Uh, the highest total in the West was uh, WD5COB. Dave, uh, we all know him. Uh, he's got a monster station. Uh, he does really well. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, but he's still east of the continent of Divide by about 10 miles. Um, so I keep telling him he's on the East Coast. <laughs> so so it's, it's what, what you expect. So, so why is it that some places in the world have all the challenge to work uh, some parts of the world on the low frequency? The 80 and 160 are the real, uh, real challenge in the challenge program. Um, you have to work as many as you can to, to, to be in the game. And uh, one of the problems out here in the West is the auroral zone. Now, everybody has, you know, has to deal with the auroral zone. It's there and it gets in everybody's way. But for us here in the West, what's behind the auroral zone is a whole lot of countries, a whole lot of DXCC, uh, Middle East, uh, you know, Asia, uh, Western Asia is is behind the rural zone, and it's a different different situation for those say in in Rome. Okay, uh, in fact, I use Rome a lot in my my discussion because in that talk I, I, I mentioned earlier, the DXCC sucks talk. Um, I I got to work to to make that presentation after I saw this one email from this one Italian guy who was. You know, crying in his beer that it took him took him a year to work DXCC on six meters. Okay, so and that, his friend down the street said he got done in nine months, and he just complained about how how awful it was. And and I had just finished DXCC, and it took me forty four years. Okay, so so that if you want to know what gets me to be obsessed is when you complain about something that's fifty times harder for me. <laughs> then you got me going. So I, I wrote that presentation, and I used. Rome as my example, you know, for example, uh, the distance between, you know, from your station and a certain, within a circle of a, of a certain radius, you know, what, what is the value of that radius or in the circle are hundred countries. And for in Rome, that number is 2,200 miles. You know, for us out here in Phoenix, 5,400 miles, okay? You know, so you have to work every country between here and Guernsey to get DXCC on six meters. In, in Europe, you can get it in double hop E in one summer you can work at the XCC. It's just so so you don't want to compare numbers, like I said before. But uh, but but the thing about the challenge is well everybody's got to work about everything. So yeah, it's tough. Um, you know, they have some tough spots, but but yeah, so do you, and your job is to just figure out how to work it. So here here's it once again, there's two tables here. <laughs> this is table one. Here we go. So here's two tables. The table on the left 
is the list of all the geez. All right. It's not looking the way I expect. Uh, table to the left is the number of countries behind your rural zone or me. All right. And here's on the right is the number of countries behind your rural zone or Rome. Okay. And guess what? They deleted one of them for you. They defeated <laughs> King Manrique. They deleted King Manrique. Yeah, okay. I operated the expedition on King Manrique. Yeah, boo hoo. But I had King Manrique on 160 through 6. Yeah. And they deleted it. And so that guy in, uh, in Rome went, oh, God, I don't work King Manrique anymore. And they're apt to be deleting more, more countries in the, you know, they started to do it midway. They did it with, you know, they did it erroneously. It's like I got, I got incensed and I got on the horn, talked to a couple of people back to lead after they did the midway thing. They undid it. But the problem for us is how the hell do you work Echo Papa, A4, A6, A9, a 160? It's, it's hard. Well, here's one thing you can do. All right. So, okay. So, over the North Pole, yeah, the rural zone is in the way. But guess what? On the, on the long path, it's not. So, uh, so we have to figure out how to work it differently than uh, is traditionally done. Now, one of the problems that, again, you know, boo hoo, more tears. Um, when you try to work stations in the Middle East um, on long path, unfortunately, the band is at the same time open to Europe. And so you have to ask uh, A, that for some discipline, you know, on, on someone in the Middle East to to work you and not run a thousand, you know, German station. And that used to be easy 30 years ago, back when, you know, there were a lot of U.S. contractors building oil fields in the Middle East. There used to be a lot of Americans there and they would get over there and they work their buddies back home. Well, they don't do that anymore. And there's Really, nobody's like that, and no, no. Yeah, there's been a whole generation, maybe two, uh, hands that have no idea there is a long path on 20 or 80. I know when I was when I was in uh, 9K2HM a couple of years ago, uh, I got in every morning on 80 long path. And over the course of the week and a half, I was there with a thousand stations and 80 meters on 80 long path. It's there all the time. It's just nobody knows it's there, but. That's our that's our trip. That's our path. We have to figure out how to do these sort of things from here. So, so how does this work? How do you do three thousand slots in ten bands? Okay, one easy point approach. So slice of dice. Okay, that's three hundred every band. Okay, you know, big deal. But work. Now, as you all know, that's that's an undoable strategy. You're not going to work three hundred on six meters. You're not going to work three hundred on one sixty. So maybe you have a different strategy, which is Let's try 330 on the bands 40 through 10. That's right. Get on a roll on seven bands. And then fill in some you know, other strategy, 310 on 80, 240 on 160, 140 on six meters. And that's actually what I did. That's how that's the equation that you can have to do to get to 3,000. Easy. Balance. This is weird. Not my computer. Not my okay, so this chart's kind of cool. This is, in my opinion, this is the rank ordering of uh, DXCC accomplishments uh, in my field. Okay, so here's kind of 40 years. 1975, I started getting interested in DXing now to the point where I achieved uh, the, the uh, 3000 challenge. And there were four cycles, four solar cycles involved. And uh, across the top are my accomplishments. Okay, first one is yeah, I got on the air with a with a, with a rotary antenna in 1975 and started uh, you know working with an old gem quad I had on a, a, a slightly guide Rome 25 power. And uh, it took me about two years, and I finally two things happened. Uh, one is I I uh, bumped into other uh, uh, equally driven people. Uh, with shorter call signs in mind, uh, who are members of CADXA and became a member. Uh, the other thing is, I completed uh, DXCC. It took me three years. All right, but after joining uh, uh, CADXA and collaborating with all of the uh, other operators at the club, 
in a couple of years, I completed five band DXCC, which is a pretty good accomplishment. Um, but it, it took me just a couple of years. Two, three years after that, at the end of the cycle, maybe there's a correlation here, I don't know. I moved to my uh, current house, which has much more property. They could put up much better, bigger antennas. And so over the course of two solar cycles, I got to uh, five band WAZ, which is a uh, which is one of the big time accomplishments. It's kind of hard to do, 80 meters is your challenge working, zone 34, 22, you know, they, they, all that stuff that's over behind the Aurora curtain uh, is, is a real challenge on that band as well. But you can work any one of these countries in this whole area, work with every one of them. Uh, so it's a little bit easier than, than the challenge, but still, it is one of the biggest accomplishments to do that. The, uh, and a couple of years after that, 2002, I got to top of the honor roll. On, on sideband. And it's like weird. Okay, you're, I thought you were a CW off. Where did you, why did you get to top of the honor roll on sideband first? And I said, well, I was busy on sideband waiting for guys to learn the code. <laughs> so, uh, so I got to a challenge point of 2,500. Now, I'll tell you, the, the secret to getting to 3,000 is to start at 2000 on day one of the program. I actually had 2000 confirmed when they kicked off the, uh, the challenge program. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the way to do it. <laughs> so since 2000, it's like 22 years, I've worked a thousand newbies or, or a little over a thousand newbies. But it's it just, it's, it's, you know, I, 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 I said it before, you may have forgotten. I don't know where you guys are in your program, in your DXCC challenge program. But I got to tell you, you better hurry up. Better pick up the pace. <laughs> it takes 40 years to do this. This is not trivial. Another big time accomplishment was the, uh, okay, this, this one here. Uh, in 2010, I got an email from uh, Bill Moore. Uh, he said, you know what, Ned, you're the first person that's had a DXCC on 11 bands support, and, which is kind of an unusual uh, accomplishment. There's no award for it. Uh, I know we talked about it on the DXCC. They talked about going to the nine day DXCC. And I said, it's going away. It's going to 11. They go, no, no one possibly could do that. I, I didn't want to tell them I had done it seven years before. But, but, uh, and everybody said, why on two meters? That's stupid. Why do you do it on two meters? Like, well, because you can't. I mean, there's 100 people that have done DXCC on two meters. So it's not like no, like 70 centimeters, yeah, there's only one or maybe two people that have done it. I think I still think the two meters should be included in the award programs because because there's a lot of activity, a lot of people on the bounce that should be. The next achievement that I think is a, a, in the rank is a digital honor roll, getting on the honor roll in the digital mode. Um, and I did almost all of it except the last one, was the first one that was done on one of the WSJT uh, applications of JT65 or Monaco. On uh, one day, it's the only time I've ever worked Monaco on digital mode. I worked on JT65 one day, and what was amazing about that is before the amplifier was cooled down, I had it confirmed on, 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 on the blog of the world. It was just, you know, it's like, wow, where were you when I needed you? And then finally, in 2017, I did reach the uh, DXCC 3000 challenge, and it was by chasing. You know, that, that rare one on 160, it chased it down, uh, I think it was Sardinia on 160 which is what it did. But here's sort of the plot. And you look at those and you go, well, all right, what's all that about? Why, why the, you know, sharp, you know, high slopes and sometimes, and not so high slopes and other times. And, uh, you know, what's that all about? How does, how does one know how to do this or what, what times are good to do that? And, and, and the best way to understand this is to kind of look at all the bands, uh, uh, and which is what I'm going to do. But this is a picture made at, uh, at Reinhardt's, not here tonight, who, uh, who uh, took a photo of me of uh, my 3,000th card. Uh, kind of a big sigh of relief. Finally, I don't have to worry about this anymore. It's done. But let's talk about the bands real quick. So 160, as you know, I'm a, I have passions for certain things. Six meters and 160 are my most interesting bands to me. They are, they're hard, they're hard to work 
the exon, and you, and things have to be just right. And you have to pay attention to propagation. You have to pay attention to the people who are going places you need. You have to you know, be there every night, every day, to, and make sure you catch that rear opening that happens. Um, but, but I started my journey on 160 by building a, um, a very, very short vertical in my backyard in my original house in Hubble, which is not too far from here. Uh, it was a 30 foot piece of waveguide, which I uh, top loaded lightly and base loaded heavily and, uh, and tried to work DX on 160. This is back in the 70s. And DXing on 160 in the 70s was a, was a completely different game than today. It was, it was still the gentleman's man back then. Um, and, and DXers were uh, not the most uh, you know, pleasant people on the, on the bands. And yeah, they, they would, uh, you know, they had aggressive tendencies and they would, they would uh, take over and jump into a pilot and try to work something and upset all the, uh, all the uh, people who were casual and had conversations on 160s. Uh, that's not the way it is today. I don't know anybody who is, you know, Casual, especially when they do, they're way up in a high end band. I don't see anybody rag you on 160 on today. Everything below 1845, I think, is all a weak signal of uh, DXing activity. Completely different than what it was in the old days. But, uh, but I finished uh, DXCC on that band uh, shortly after moving to Astro, where I built a little bit bigger antenna. And it was so much of a challenge to complete it. And I'm so tired of it. Process of getting QSLs that I, I pretty much gave up on the band. It's just too much to maintain. And I, I got off the band for, for I think it's about 18 years. I did, never got on 160 at all until one day somebody mentioned uh, that OJ0 was easy to work on 160. You know? So I, I, I connected my Mosley Pro 67 up and I could hear the station. I, I got the tuner to sort of match it, and I worked in one call, and I call that the, the fatal QSO, that it got me re-engaged into 160, just like in the worst I ever had it ever before. Because right after working OJ0, I worked another new one, and I realized, oh, God, there's, there's a bunch more, I guess, I can work easily. And uh, uh, over the course of time, I got up to, to 217, which is about the number I had when I finally finished the, the challenge. Uh, and this was before I joined forces with Lee on the Sabbard site in the eighth circle out there. Uh, I wish I'd have had that again. I think that's a lot of it here. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been an adventure. It's also an adventure to figure out how this works. Pardon me. I'm not doing this again, but this is, uh, we'll figure out how to get mine to. I'll give you all So here's. So here's the, the chart of 160 Qs. As you can see, I, I was doing nothing until I moved out of my that, uh, backyard, short vertical situation, got into uh, my new house, got to 100 and I quit, and then had the fatal QSO and it's been this uh, rocket ride ever since. 80 meters is, is a little bit like, you know, about 160, but it, it tends to be open uh, a lot, it's a lot easier for this band to be open. So you're gonna have to eat your time working countries. But, uh, but I had the, uh, I started in that, that base loaded vertical in my backyard trick. I had it, that same vertical work on 80 and 160 and the switch bands, I go outside and move an alligator clip, uh, which was pretty convenient. Um, and I managed to work quite a few that way. Um, but as I got serious on, on the DXCC challenge program, I was, I was Realizing that I was having a lot of trouble uh, burning through whatever propagation the challenges there were to get over the pole into the, to the Middle East. So I came up with this plan to come up with a, a, a three element vertical array in my backyard at my current house. And it was after I did that and added a few receive antenna systems that I tried several, I tried to, uh, it's called a Waller flag. You may have heard of that, it's a pair of flag antennas you could rotate. And you can adjust the phasing between the flags to get some very deep, deep nulls, good patterns. And I also played with the receive four square uh, in between the three element transmit antenna and a number of receive antennas. I managed to, to bring my tally up to a very, very good, good stead for this, for this program. Uh, 
traverse. So here's, but it's, but it was a steady slow grind. I mean, it was just something you have to keep working at. And what you'll see is that independent of where you are in the solar cycle, uh, 80 meters is, is about the same. It's really not influenced at all by solar terrestrial conditions. It's pretty much a, about the same all the time. 40 is, is also like 80, it is not dependent on sunspot uh, solar activity to, incur, to enhance propagation on 40. So it's, they're, they're very similar. Um, something I, <laughs> and we all remember this in the old days with on 40, working uh, sideband, working crossband. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, and I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I made many QSOs in contests where you would tune down below, you'd hear somebody and he's listening up to 25 and when he goes to receive, you spin the dial for a while, get it close to 25 or whatever you call, spin it back, get them tuned back in and you know, they work them. And uh, that's what you had to do. My great PR4, that's all I could do until I invested in that remote VFO. But, but 40 was a challenge, uh, working a lot of VX on that band uh, because of that problem. So when I moved, to my current house, I had a rotary dipole at 85 feet. It really, really was tremendous, and it got me where I am. And, and as you can see, this again, like 80, it's independent of the sunspot uh, activity. It's always there. You just have to wait for someone to go to these countries that you need. 30, special story here. I, it was 30 meters. Was one of the what's called the Warp 79 bands, um, and what was unique about this band is that it, when it initially was, uh, uh, we had privileges to operate. Uh, there were kind of uh, gaps in the. It wasn't a contiguous band. There was, I believe, it was around 10, 113 and below, and 10, 118 and above. I believe or we had a little window we couldn't transmit in somewhere in the middle of the band. It was kind of a kludgy band, not the same. AWRL uh, per agreements that somebody uh, didn't uh, award uh, any program, no awards programs for that band originally. And so I sort of said well, to myself, well, why work anything there to account for anything? So I focused on all the other bands. And then in 1994, AWRL came back, came out and said, oh, well, we are now uh, changing. The awards program we're including a 30 meter VFCC. And oh, by the way, it counts all the way back to 1979. And so I had uh, missed the whole solar cycle. So uh, not no activity on the band. And uh, so I think I caught up. Let's do this. So as you can see, this is uh, what happens when you uh, when you put up the Pro 67. I Mosley Pro 67 has a dipole on 30 meters. Works fine. Uh, and it works just about everything. So I, I probably caught up pretty close, but I, I still, some of the countries I'm missing are the ones that I didn't work back before I, I and, I, and I no longer trust the AWR, like, like 60 meters, does that count today? No, are they gonna count it 10 years from now? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd suggest working it. <laughs> working on 60, you never know. 20. Uh, what can you say about 20? Well, what's unique about 20 or is the first of the bands, lowest of the bands, were the, the presence or absence of solar site, solar uh, sunspots uh, makes a big difference. All right, so when I started in my early days, I had a simple, you know, a vertical on my roof. Uh, it was a halfway vertical. I didn't want a four way, but I wanted to go all the way to the halfway. Bigger. Uh, but it was also harder to to feed because it's very high impedance and all kinds of problems. But I overcame them and I got pretty active on 20, but I wasn't highly competitive until I put up the gem quad and then I started really, uh, really safe. And ever since then I've had, you, know, you must have a good antenna on, on 20 uh, to, to, to be involved in any uh, DXCC program. Uh, and it's, it does follow the sunspot pattern as you can see that uh, at the beginning, and it's, it's what's in, what's not showing. Give me this. Nope. Is it? Okay. What's what is missing in this picture is in, in, are all the bar graphs that are associated with the sunspots, and and it's too bad it's not here. But every time there's a fast ramp 
increase at that's the beginning of a sunspot cycle. And that's important to know in that, um, okay, so you're getting into a new sunspot cycle. All of a sudden you are hearing places you've not heard for a long time and there are stations you don't recognize, never heard of before. And the front, the first half of every peak is a flurry of activity, everybody works everybody. And then after the peak or just after the peak, you worked everybody and there's nobody new. And so nothing really happens on the second half or the backside of a peak. The other thing that happens at every peak is that's when the A index is high all the time. Apparently the solar uh, way these cycles go is that the front half, the A index is generally low. Uh, you get you know, some days when it spikes up, but in the second half of the cycle, it's always, it's very much more uh, prone to have the geomagnetic storms, okay, which is, it doesn't lend to good propagation. And, and maybe that also uh, explains why well, I think it works many, and I think we all experience it. It's too bad this picture is out. 17 meters is a lot like 30 for me. Uh, be, before I put my my Mosley Pro 67 up, I didn't really have a good antenna. I had some vertical or something like that uh, in the backyard of my new house, but it, and it just wasn't there. But the minute I put up the Pro, Pro with three elements on 17, it was, I mean, that's 300 countries inside of like four years. That's uh, an amazing, that was an amazing experience. It seemed like every day, every week, I'd work one or two. It was just, uh, it was just amazing. Uh, I still remember these days, 17 is one of my, Favorite bands because it's just when 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 prop is there, it's even better than twenty, less absorption, uh, maybe not as long, but uh, but you can get and the skip skip zones are small. Okay, at twenty, you hear lots of uh, you know you hear the distance station, but you hear all the hops in between. But when you start getting the higher bands, you don't hear those hops in between sometimes. It seems to be a lot quieter. Fifteen meters is is a fun band. Uh, uh, one of the problems we had here on fifteen meters back in the seventies, and a couple of you guys remember this, is that we also have uh, channel three, uh, which was ABC at the time. Now, I my house on Bubble is like three blocks away from the uh, motor oil plant where I work, and a couple of my neighbor in back of me was uh, another engineer. He worked at Mosul, but not him. Uh, he was a high-fi enthusiast, and he also liked to watch Charlie's Angels. <clears throat> All right. And so I quickly learned to not get on 15 when Charlie Green was on okay. uh, or Monday Night Football. I avoided Channel 3 by the play. In fact, one of the reasons why I moved up to Northeast Phoenix when I did is that that part of town is blocked from South Mountain and you can't see any of the stations on South Mountain. You have to be on cable. And so that's the reason I went to that part of town is that everybody there was on cable and I didn't worry about Charlie Major's <laughs> So, uh, and you can work every day. That, that is the, the ultimate band. And again, you can see the strong influence between the solar cycle uh, onsets and the number of new countries that you work on that band. Uh, and after I got to a certain point, you're in sort of compression where you're down to just a handful and you just have to wait. You're no longer only dependent on propagation. You also have to wait for the occasional uh, the expedition to be mounted to go to some place like Peter One or Pluve or something like that. Well, I found to be uh, kind of a disappointing band. It's never, never gets up to your expectations. I mean, yeah, the prop is great, but there's nobody on it. They don't, it, it was always the kind of this, you know, it, it, even in the 70s and 80s, or the 80s, 90s, I should say, it wasn't as popular uh, to be activated by the expeditions. It, it just seemed to be the forgotten band. I, I don't know what it is, but I, I missed quite a few on that band because it just, it just was, you know, I, I worked it on all the other 10 and 12, fine. Uh, you know, a lot of the expeditions take tri -banders. They don't take uh, pain uh, work band antennas. <clears throat> so it was always a, they're trying to work with a dipole or, or something that's uh, not up to the uh, sun. Uh, but I still need the, the most 
Uh, this band I need 17 countries on still, and simple ones, but uh, just because it's just been very, very hard to get someone to go there with a, with a decent station on 12 meters. Uh, 10 was a, was a fun band for me from the beginning. I mean, my early days uh, uh, on, on radio were on 10 meters. Uh, I was a 10-10 member. Uh, I, I, I used to enjoy getting a work with the summer spread a key. Uh, and then, you know, bands open to Europe or Asia and the sunspot peaks. It was just a, just a pure joy. <clears throat> but I've always had a, a, a good antenna on that band from the very beginning. I'm going to struggle with this too much. I still need a handful, but but I, I early on, I got I some very good high totals on that band. And I've been, uh, you know, slowly over the course of time, trying to fill in some, some holes. Uh, over the course of time. I haven't worked to do it on this band in a long, long time. The next one I'm waiting for is Kosovo. And we haven't had 10 meter propagation good yet to uh, Eastern Europe uh, on 10 when someone has the wherewithal to get on band. Uh, you know, it's, it should be easy. I mean, we all were YUs and 4Os and all kinds of stuff in that area, but just Kosovo seems to be less interested in active uh, camp radio. All right, six meters. Hey, you guys probably all know. Uh, that I'm, I'm a real six meter nut. It's always been been that way for me since you know getting into ham radio in the '60s. I just uh, was, I started out as a technician and I cut my teeth on six meters. It's just been where I, I like to go. What's kind of interesting and sort of uh, telltale sign of the, the level of my disease is uh, is how I work DX on on my first Yagi antenna in cycle 21. It I had a 70 foot tower and my six meter antenna was a five element uh, KLM, I think it was, which is a two element cell, four element, really four element antenna. And I had a side mounted on the tower in somewhere, Europe. So, so in the morning, I would work the European opening if there was one. And once you got to a point in time of the day when the prop flipped, I would get my climbing belt out, my climbing tower, disconnect the antenna from the tower, pass it on the back, and then hook it onto the other list of power headed to Japan. And that was a daily ritual. <laughs> day in, day out. This is how bad it can get. <laughs> but it, I work lots of stuff, uh, you know, lots of grid squares, lots of countries. Um, and uh, the, when I moved up north, I made it kind of a a, an important sort of minimum uh, requirement for the new station would have a, actually a rotary six meter antenna that I did not have to climb the tower to get to. And, uh, and, and even with that, it, it's six is a challenge. I mean, you're, you're, you're in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you know, you either work DX on, on, on F2 propagation or you work some of the Caribbean on multi top heat. That was pretty much DXing as it was. Um, you get to 70, 80 countries with that scheme. But something happened and, uh, and, and in the last 15, 12, 15 years where, where the uh, multi hop E has just turned into a really fascinating kind of find. Like we, this has always been here. We didn't know about it. Uh, you know, and I think. It, it's a combination of a lot of factors. One is, you know, six meter operation in Europe was very minimal until the mid late 80s. Um, and, and I know that's when I started first working Europeans was in the late 80s. Um, and, and so there was not a lot of experience Nobody really understood the band that well. And, and so, uh, and I remember working, uh, I had two multi hop E's uh, oh, the contacts in my life in uh, over the course of like 35 years on six meters at some point in time that career. And, and I was doing some research on that and I found out that and they're both in contact with Spain. And as I did more research, I found out, oh, guess what? It's the same guy with two calls. Okay, he had, he had on a call chain and I worked with again. But it just points out that, that, that the paths are, are, are limited. There's just so many, just a limited, uh, set of directions that this the multi hop E phenomena exists, it seems. Um, and, and I know for a long time, people on the East Coast were plotting 
the TV beacons, you know, the European Channel Zero beacons, uh, were, were in the high 40 megahertz range, and and uh, and VHF proponents on the East Coast would plot the the daily uh, signal strengths of these these beacons, and and I started finally figuring out that 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 was a good uh, predictor for when opening would occur on six meters to the East Coast. So so in the early 2000s, you know, 2010, uh, it started to become much more prevalent to cap, catch these multi-top uh, six meter openings. They're, uh, they're fascinating. If you haven't been on one, they're just, they're just craziness for a couple of minutes where you're sitting there looking at a dead band and all of a sudden uh, pops uh, you know, four U1 ITU or something like that. And, and you, you know, you and all your friends are calling everywhere. It's just, just sheer madness. It, 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 and, and, and fortunately today, there, there is uh, some discipline that is uh, followed by most uh, DX, DXs on six meters to follow a convention about transmitting in, the, in a west uh, time uh, slot and listen during the east time slot, uh, whatever that is. And I, I don't want to say what it is because it seems to change every year. So you kind of have to, you know, you know watch the lay of the land, see what everybody's doing this year, and follow, follow suit. Uh, but, but when that happens, then it's fun. You don't have to be so concerned about uh, uh, destroying your, your friend's neighbor's receiver while you transmit at full power trying to work you know, European and wispy little signals on Europe. Uh, hopefully at some point, we'll start to use more than one channel in six weeks. That's a, that's a new problem. It just fills up so quickly that it's all QRM and they can't can't sort anything out. At some point, I think there needs to be some agreement with everybody that this is a new plan. We're gonna, you know, if you are looking for another continent, uh, you're on this channel. If you're looking, if you're looking for casual stuff, you're on this channel. So, you know, you gotta have some some way of, of thinning thinning the herd here a little bit. So, don't know how that's gonna happen, when that's gonna happen, but, but it needs to happen before it's too long. So so here's the plot. <laughs> Scale and not the way up there, but the 140 was the number I had to get to to be uh, competitive at, uh, at 3,000 challenge. So it's that's a number to keep in your mind if you're if you're thinking of achieving this six 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 meters to this level is going to be you know where you have to be. Now I'm sitting currently at about 161, uh, and that's because of some uh, amount of work we've been doing on our site out in Safford and some upgrades in my home station. I've managed to do. Uh, pretty well, and, and that's where any future uh, increase in my tally is going to occur. Mostly going to be on six meters. So, so past since I submitted for three thousand, uh, you know, I continued on, and that's that's the thing I find interesting is that there, there is no uh, future awards or, or or bars or anything that's going to ever be administered by ARRL. But you pretty much know that everybody above three thousand doesn't want to retire and, and call it quits. Many of them still are at it. Uh, I know a couple of guys I know, N1DG, uh, uh, Grima, and K5NA, uh, they have gotten on the, since completing 3000, they've got on the six meter EME in order to continue to work more countries on six meters. So it, the, the drive is still there. It doesn't ever go away. Uh, so, so don't try to tell your wife that this will all stop at some point. <laughs> Every year, yeah. but, uh, but since then, since I, I, I achieved 3,000, I've worked 25 new ones on 160 using the eight circle out there in Safford, uh, five new ones on uh, 80 using the four square out there. That antenna is just the dream. I wish I had that in my life. I, I, I had a net of six new ones on 40 through 10, uh, some plus, some minus, I, I lost. You know, Kingman Reef, obviously, uh, but I also picked up some Kosovo, QSOs, a few others, but 25 new ones on six meters as well. So, so six and 160 are really, you know, like I have my summertime mode and my wintertime mode. Uh, so I can continue to try to harvest these things. But to get there, uh, <clears throat> the, the, there are lots of different things you need to, to address in order to be able to work. Uh, uh, these sort of totals, uh, receiving antennas on the low frequencies. I, I've given talks on this before. 
it's it's the real challenge here and, and and i can i can provide some some help on different receipt antennas um, it, it's a challenge in, this, in, in urban areas anymore with about electronic crap that's out there it's just hard to get away from all this stuff and so i really think that remote receiving systems uh, need to be exploited and that's something that I've, I've talked about a couple times about you know, maybe a sharing a receiving site is a is a good idea short of a full-blown remote site you just have some place where you could hear you'd be, you'd be better off but but there are rules about you know what's a contact and where's your station and where are all the parts of the station i know that makes it hard because they have a, about a thousand foot radius or something all your stuff has to be inside of some radius uh, for it to count so so remote isn't the total solution but but i think it needs to be considered uh, in, in in today's you know the way it is today it's just hard to find a clean spectrum inside of an urban area anymore uh, the other thing that's kind of important uh, is spotting networks. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you share? How do you harvest information about, you know, uh, who's on, where, you know, when are they on, when are they going, you know, are they on right now? Who's working them? Uh, a lot of information that you can glean off the internet to sort all that stuff out. Uh, it's also kind of cool to uh, reverse peak networks. That's kind of something fun. And this works on six meters. Okay, so you hear something on six you like, you get on, start calling CQ. What I do immediately is to go to a PSK reporter to see where I am being spotted in Europe, to see where the propagation is, how, how you know, you know, how is it moving around, and that sort of stuff. So there's lots, lots of new, interesting information out there that can help you uh, in the game. Uh, this used to be more important. I know in the in the, uh, the West Coast, the Expo is, and that it kind of dates me, but that was a, what, a monthly magazine uh, newsletter. And I know we had one of the members of my coffee clutch group at the Motorola was the subscriber and they would bring it in and we'd all just, you know, just read it to shreds, uh, just to pick up all the, all the information, all the really exotic call signs of all the stations being worked in the West. And it was, a, it was a great source of information. Obviously things have evolved tremendously since then. Um, but uh, it's good to stay connected to the information. Obviously, uh, what I don't have on here is log the world. Uh, well, I do. Um, it's it is the way, the best way to most affordable way to get confirmations uh, today. It's not it's not free, uh, but it's uh, it does uh, put a, 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 a helps in reducing the amount of cost for for sending uh, cards and you know, bank postage and all that. I wish I wish it was an, another way to do this, but it's, it's the way it's going to work for now. Uh, managers, I, I don't see this much anymore. I don't, I'm not sure the last time I sent a card from the manager. You know, and maybe a couple of these guys in Africa have a, a, a VA3 and BTR, or there are a few managers left in the game. But it's a, I remember the remember the W5GO list and the GO list. You said it like a newspaper that they have. Call sign and hand for it's very important. You had, to, you had to know this stuff in order to get your cards. So kind of all the way. It's a good thing. The expeditions. This is where the you know this is what makes it all happen. The fact that these gargantuan teams of skilled operators with piles of really good gear um, go to these places and, and put signals on the air that really make this all possible. It's just uh, they're the, they couldn't do this without without their help. And, and then local club members, like I said, I, I bumped into CADXA early on um, and all these guys with the short call signs and, uh, and, and driven like I was. And, and it's always important to have a, a, a set of associates nearby to work with you, help you out um, uh, and, and being able to, you know, to, to find these uh, openings to, uh, They'll put up antennas. It's, it's really important, really, really important part of the whole hobby. And then, of course, there's uh, it, uh, this list of, of the closest friends of mine who helped me in my days uh, getting on. I know they, the cluster group, K7 and and 7 cx and Jim and 7 us is online here. They, they were essential. They, they provided a sort of this lifeblood, this, this, uh, this 
steady stream of info that would uh, either interest you or not, uh, either help you or not, whatever it was there, and you could use it as you needed it to for whatever it is you wanted to do. And it was they selflessly provided these uh, uh, these networks to us that just enabled the hobby. I mean, it's exploded from then, but it was very critical at the time, and it's really an important part of of this uh, this overall process. And, and I have a lot of friends in this club that have helped me, supported me in, in this uh, lifelong endeavor. And then of course, there are the foundations that, uh, that, that uh, step up to help uh, well-managed teams uh, accomplish some unbelievable things uh, in pulling off these de-expeditions in these rare places. Now, I've been on a few of them. I, I've never personally uh, run a expedition to a rare place. I've uh, been on enough of them to know what it takes. Uh, I have uh, most of the expeditions I've on, I provide a service that I am good at in engineering, uh, helping design, you know, antenna systems, structures, uh, you know, whatever I can to support them. But but the expeditions are 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 only can happen if there is financial support. And I know Northern Cal is the preeminent uh, foundation in the game, and uh, I've been a board member for now for 12, 13 years now, and it's been it's been a lot of fun to help uh, both financially and morally, moral support to uh, many many of the expeditions. It's, it's an important part of the process. So you might say, well, what's next? You, you've got your three thousand. What, what what keeps you going? Well, thirty one hundred. That's my new number. <laughs> three thousand sixty one. And I have a plan to get to 3100 and I'll I'll think again what to do I know when I get there. So uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>